Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining our second meetup for GraphQL Singapore meetup. I'm glad to have you here. Hi. Um, please take a seat. Uh, so today we are lucky to have Carlos from GraphQL Hong Kong. Uh, he's based in Hong Kong and uh, Shenzhen. He also helped a lot organizing this event. He just he just talking. I, I, I believe we all met him. And in two months, yeah, he will be like in GraphQL basically everywhere in Asia, at least in Thailand, India, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, right? Yeah. In two months, I saw your tweet. Yeah, you can hear more hear hear more from him by following his Twitter. He will later have a talk here also. We also lucky to have Tiru here. He's in remotely somewhere else. He will join in the session later. He's a manager of product and engineering in Hasura, which is our sponsor. Welcome to the GraphQL decade. Uh, because this 2020 is a new decade, so normally we say a happy new decade, I don't know. Uh, my, name is <laughs> my name is Mark. I'm the organizer of GraphQL Singapore Meetup, and uh, this is my Twitter. Normally I don't use Twitter a lot, but recently I find it very useful for finding information and knowing people. So I put mine here. Uh, these are some quick links about our meetup. So, of course, the meetup link, I believe, I assume that's the way you find us. Uh, we also have a website which you can find the link to submit your talk. So, if you are interested in talking here or sharing here or just maybe uh, doing some very simple workshop or sharing, you can submit through this link or you can just Twitter uh, DM me or something like that. We also have a Twitter, a uh, Telegram channel. Uh, where you can simply join and uh, ask questions if you want. Um, so for when, when I create the meetup, they say we, you need to frame something about why you create this thing. So uh, I say like we are a community for uh, Singapore engineers to share everything about GraphQL and uh, exciting promising things around <coughs> it. And that's really the meaning of creating a meetup. But uh, like I just said, we need to boost uh, positive cycle for more sharing and uh, to improve more people to get awareness of this new technology. And uh, if, you if you have questions, please feel free to ask in the Meetup or in the Telegram channel or just email or some everything. Uh, be I believe there are me or someone else, we are always willing to share, to answer, in if we can help. Uh, we'd like to take this chance to shout out to our sponsors, Hasura, and uh, we really appreciate them to provide the pizza and the drinks over there. Uh, they, so they are an open source engine that connects to your databases and microservices. And uh, they provide a production ready GraphQL API. Uh, if you're interested in related things, you can just go to their website. And uh, they have some tutorials here who can get your hands dirty quickly. We also thank Hackerspace SG for providing the space. Uh, the boss is over there. Uh, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. Round of applause. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> the website is hackspace.sg. So if you are more interested in this space, just check, check their website. They have also a membership, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, we need members. Please Yeah, membership here. Can check the link. OK, so let's suppose if you already have some experience with GraphQL in your work or in your project, uh, please uh, come up and share something in the future meetup, like following the link I just said, or just tweet, just send me a tweet or something else. Uh, we have a list of possible topics. This is also on our <coughs> official website. Uh, assume each of them are everything of them are interesting and uh, uh, they're all enough for like at least fifteen second, fifty minutes to thirty minutes talk. Uh, you can take a look at this. For me personally, I think uh, if you recently just migrated to TypeScript, React, GraphQL stack in production, you will definitely have something to share about the experience. Also about some best practice, about safety issue, about performance. They are all very interesting topics, and yet we don't have a lot of resource about them in community worldwide. So if you have something to share, please just shout out, because you are very likely to be the first, pe first person to share these kind of topics. <coughs> OK, uh, so uh, we want to have a session about introducing to GraphQL. What is it? How to use it? Why do we want it? In, as like I just did a sh quick survey, over 50% of people here, at least they only maybe just heard of the name, except anything else. So we, we'd like to do a quick one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, 
we like after at least after this meetup, you can know how to talk to your colleagues about this new idea. Actually, it's not quite new, because I just this this page I just added is is put it in 2015. It's iPhone <coughs> 6s. Now it's already iPhone 11. And uh, the uh, the graph Facebook just open source GraphQL in production in 2016, I think, and. Uh, Right now it's over the past three years, but still many people haven't heard of it. So, so we, need we need to push, to push things, things forward. forward. And, and uh, uh, happy new year for this Twitter for year 2020. The the big front end stack for 2020 will be TypeScript React GraphQL. I just saw it and I uh, screenshot it because I agree with it. And uh, if somewhere has someone here who want to pick out some new stuff for front end developing, these three things are uh, definitely the right direction. And uh, this is the report I just shared you, shared with you, in the state of jazz report. Uh, so GraphQL is definitely gr have growing awareness worldwide, but still not enough. Uh, I mean, it can have definitely more promise in future in the uh, in the future. Okay. So let's just just jump into the one one section. Uh, GraphQL itself, uh, so like I just said, it's not a library, it's not a tool. It's, uh, it itself is a specification. You, treat, you should treat it as a query language for your APIs, and you also treat it as a document. And it also tells, uh, including both front end and the back end, about how to query data. For front end, you, it gives you a form to query data, to how to send a GraphQL request to the back end and to fetch data as much as you want. For the back end, you need to follow the schema, follow the GraphQL schema. You have negotiated with your front end about how to provide data for each field in, in the schema. Uh, you, uh, you may not know what is schema. We will introduce later. But this is a general idea. Itself is a documentation. It's a specification. And uh, it's, not some, it's not some language like Java or JavaScript. Um, you can learn it, but uh, you can implement it in any, any languages. It's not limited. And uh, itself is not a it's not a new like it's not a new protocol. Uh, GraphQL service is still a uh, HTTP request. Mostly you send to your server. This is what we normally like. Uh, wow, I don't know why it's not so why it's not so not clear, but you can still see it. So this is what we like in our normal daily work. We have a lot of front end apps, including web apps, iOS apps, Android apps. Uh, these apps are like of the same product, but we are sending requests to the backends. The backends may be the same, may be different. Maybe, maybe a lot of services which is occurring from different endpoints, different databases, different microservices. It happens a lot, maybe in everyone's company, right? This is what we normally see. But what problem is that this have is that it will uh, very likely, no, if it's not well managed, it will be soon become a chaos because uh, the product PM, they always want to add features or remove features or just change features. So likely many links in this picture will be legacy and uh, will be outdated. And uh, with this procedure, many legacy code will come here and uh, for in the improved and, and make the back end and front end very bad, to very hard to negotiate because we have a lot of legacy stuff we need to maintain. GraphQL is acting like this uh, in this role. Uh, just, like I just said, we have front-end web app, mobile app, or other app, but they are sending requests exactly to one endpoint, to the GraphQL endpoint. Uh, they, for their HTTP requests or some other requests, they are sending to this single endpoint, which is providing GraphQL query data. And uh, this endpoint will be working with, uh, the backend will be working with this endpoint and uh, to respond with data, but not necessarily from one place. So it can be from database, it can be from some legacy stuff, it can be from very old, uh, very old projects, it can be also from directly from database. That can also help, that can all happen. Depends on the backend, depends on how you want to implement. But all you need to do is to implement how to resolve each field of the query. But still, uh, what does the query look like? As they uh, did introduce, uh, I will do it later. But still a little bit history class. So like I said, it's in 2015 by open source by Facebook. Uh, so if the if the history is true, then Facebook has uh, used GraphQL in inter internally in from 2012 to improve the performance of its 
own iOS and Android, <coughs> Android apps. So at that time, they are using REST request a lot, and uh, their app has some performance issue. They cannot deal with low, in low speed internet very well. And uh, they are sending a lot of redundant requests to backends to, for their own features. So they want to solve it. They internally have um, pushed a pro project uh, similar to GraphQL. But then, after 2015, they decided to open source it to make it to public. And uh, they did make it to production usage uh, around 2016. And then it soon became a worldwide, worldwide com community beca because it really benefits a lot of projects. and. Uh, Many more and more users are using it, and uh, in the worldwide, uh, like I said, more users, more open source projects, more, uh, more, pro more programmers using these projects and providing feedbacks and uh, improvement. That's a positive cycle. You can implement in any language, including Rust, including Java, including JavaScript, any language. It's not limited. This is the I, I get it from Apollo website, so. Uh, from GraphQL website, website, so this is a list of language in server side that currently have at least community support. Uh, by community support, I mean that these are they they will have the support that is being used in production. And uh, for this language, you can just feel free to use GraphQL in your implementation in your future projects. And these are the list of companies which are using GraphQL in their in their products. Uh, some say that Facebook is the only user. That is not true. Um, but Facebook is definitely the largest user. That's correct. Because now in Facebook and uh, in Instagram, in, the, in their own products, and as I recently read a report like over 30 API requests are, are over GraphQL. I think that's very likely to be true. And also there are other companies are using it heavily. And also, this is happening in China, in India, in Europe, and uh, also here in Singapore. OK, so until now, I'm all saying <coughs> just, I'm just talking. I didn't show any stuff. So well, GitHub has provided a very great place to, for us to do some experiments. By experiments, I mean that you don't need to write a single line of code. You just need to send queries. And uh, these APIs are production ready uh, because GitHub itself is using these APIs. Uh, so if you go to developer.github.com slash v4 slash explorer, you will see this. You can also Google for GitHub uh, GraphQL and you will see the page. Okay, so let's do some simple click. Uh, when we get into the page, you will see this explorer. This is the explorer where we can send GraphQL requests to the backend from front end using I assume everyone uses Postman or tools like that, right? Postman to send requests, to send REST requests to the backend. Yeah, of course. Postman can also send GraphQL requests. Also, there are many like tools like uh, GraphQL Play Playground, GraphQL IQL, something like that. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of tools can do the similar thing. Oh, this is Graph, Graph IQL, OK. Uh, can do the same thing. Uh, but if you want to use this API, you need to use some real data in production. So you need to use your account data. Uh, for me, I'm using the GraphQL Singapore <laughs> account because I don't want to use my own account. I don't want to mess things up. But uh, yeah, just feel free because uh, they're all production. You see, they say make use of your real live production data. So after you log in, you will uh, authenticate your request. So if you're trying to send an unauthentic request, you will definitely have some error. But there is a trick here. So for REST requests, if you send unauthenticated unauthenticated request, we will report you some unauthorized error, right? By some HTTP code in response code. Um, but that is not the case in GraphQL because we don't have HTTP. We don't have the REST response code anymore. Every response code is 200. You need to do the error implementation by yourself. Uh, this uh, most cases, I mean. Yeah, so. Uh, every request will expect a response from the server, but you need to get error by yourself. Uh, of course, many uh, many client side libraries have already done the job for you, so you don't need to worry about that. <coughs> but for here, I'm sending. What I'm saying, say, saying that is that I'm all sending authenticated requests. So this is a query for logging. If I'm tr if I want to ask for something about. Uh, Current locked locked in user. This is what I want to ask for. Want to ask for? You can just 
ask for it, and it will get your back, get the data back, which is <coughs> exactly what you want. The, f the data object will look like the query object, but you can see here, as a request, it's still, it's still a HTTP request. You get the response to 200 OK, and uh, the, pr the header is the same as your, uh, the query body. Response is a string, uh, is a JSON object. Uh, that's how the request looks like. So it's actually very similar to REST request, right? But uh, you are doing it in a different way. OK. Uh, so far, any questions? If you have, just feel free to raise your hand. OK. Uh, I did save some requests for, for showcase. So, <coughs> so here comes a, a case. A case. Suppose that I'm writing, a, I'm writing a client for GitHub. GitHub has only provided me this. Uh, but this is actually all what I need, because we have docs here. The Document Explorer is uh, very fancy stuff about GraphQL. <coughs> GraphQL because it comes naturally with uh, with the code when you deploy in your uh, in your endpoint, it will come together. You can get normally for every GraphQL endpoint, you can get a similar document look like this, which will provide all the types of query and mutation. Uh, so f first, first introduction here: query is what you get data, and the mutation is normally you want to change data, like you want to update, you want to Add or delete. So one question. Okay. Uh, how how deep I can go in terms of the nesting? Okay, so uh, that's actually a very funny question. So if you don't do any limitation, you can do in uh, just endlessly. Let's suppose you have a we have a relation like this uh, user friend. So each friend is a user, right? So we can write a query like that: uh, user friend, user friend, user friend, user friend. You can just do it endlessly. Because uh, it is a graph, and uh, in graph you can just uh, traverse unlimitedly, 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 endlessly, right? Uh, sorry. Um, but that is a safety issue, and uh, for the server side, we need to limit that because if you if you allow that, we are soon exhausted to your server resource. So you need to limit the depth of your request. Uh, so can we use some regression schema for this? Sorry? Or uh, nested structure? Uh, nested structure is, nested, nested yeah. structure is allowed, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, can we use some recursion schema? Or we, we should like directly describe our tree, like friends of friends of friends, and we should like put everything in the square. Yeah, you, 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 can you can build it dynamically if you want it. Uh, okay. But probably, you know, if you're going to build like a huge like graphical query, and you are going to go through some limitations, and your query is not going to be valid for the backend side. But if yeah, you, you want that, you can build yeah. whatever you want. Then. Just in case, I, I don't know which case you want to ask friend or friend or friend, but if you want that, you can create that, but maybe the server won't allow you to do that. Uh, so this is normally what a request looks like. Uh, so the trick is that all the requests I've been sending are sending to the same endpoint. That's the first trick. And the second trick is that inside the schema, we can ask everything <coughs> if it is provided here. So let's say if I want to ask something about a repository. So I don't know what's inside the repository. I need to take a look at it. I, I need to take a look at it. So I search for repository. I get into the type. I can see that a repository contains the content for a project. And I can see that inside the, inside the reposi repository object, we can have all these fields. So for all these fields, actually, I, I can just get them from here. And uh, you should be able to autofill, see? Because uh, why, why can we do that? Because the schema is fixed. It is there already when you're trying to send requests to the server. Because this is the only endpoint we have. Um, for this particular response, was there a unique ID that was implied? Uh, yeah, the, there will be a unique ID. It depends on the client implementation. Okay. So. Uh, like in the newest Apollo client version, we they have a cache. So for cache, they have the ID for each request, <coughs> and uh, they do the cache based on the ID. A cache. Cache, yeah. So this particular strings, the GraphQL login, was for a particular uh, resource ID, which was implied in the request. I'm guessing, right? Sorry. But say say there are multiple viewer logins, right? Yeah. In your backend. So 
is there might be some way on your client side to specify which viewer login you want to fetch, right? Like okay. right now, I'm guessing there's only one viewer um, login. Yeah, because this is authentic request, like, right? So as yes, is here, I have signed in as blah blah. So from the server side, I have received several user uh, several users sending me the same request, like you said, right? right. But several but each request have each authenticated. Okay, this yeah. the yeah. the implied parameter over here was your login. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 that's my login info actually. Sure. And uh, if you ask only if I, like I said, if there is a REST <coughs> endpoint who pro which provides the same information like this, looks exactly like this. But I'm developing another page, which I only want to show the number of my start repositories. I don't want all these other stuff. They are redundant to me. What I can do is I just simply remove them. OK, so this is the request I will be sending for this page, for this particular, <laughs> for this particular feature. You will just get as much as you want. Also, another case is that for implementation for search, um, maybe we have met a case that we want to implement a search feature, but the search feature can be about users, can be about posts, can be about everything. But different things may have different endpoints because you are searching for different database objects in backend. But here we can also, we're sending to the same endpoint. But uh, as long as they have the search, search method implemented here, if I click here, it has search query. The search query will perform a search across resources. But the search, um, th this depends on a specific implementation. But here, the search will just report, report everything you want, but with different type. So here, if I perform this search request, if I search for type repository, uh, I need to make it bigger. So here is the search, search request I just performed. I want to search for GraphQL Singapore in GitHub, but I want to search for repository and issues. So normally, if you write it in REST, you need to perform at least two requests sending for different things, right? But here, you only send one request. And uh, in this request, you can ask exactly whatever you want. And uh, because this response is repository, so I can ask for anything that inside repository in this single request if I want. And that's basically what it looks like, what the GraphQL query looks like. OK, cool. But as a, another show here. So right now, I'm all doing get things. I'm all doing query things. <coughs> uh, I'm all fetching data from the server side. What if I want to change things? And so for GraphQL, we have mutation here. Mutation is something we are changing. Uh, the definition is that if you write in mutation, you are doing changes on the things in the backend. So, like a, for example, there is a create repository mutation. I'm doing this, and uh, I'm sending, I'm sending some, I'm sending the create repository date, create create repository query to the backend uh, with input. Uh, how to Yeah, input is here. So imp uh, this is some details we, you may not need to, need to know now. Uh, this is some um, query vari variables. But uh, so far, you only need to know that I'm sending this object here uh, equally as this variable in the query, in, in the mutation. And uh, I'm sending the create repository mutation to the backend. And uh, I'm asking for this data if the, crea if the creation is successfully. That's what this mutation is doing. I don't know whether I can make it if I send it. it <laughs> OK, it returns an error because it's un unprocessable, because name already exists on the account. See, now this is an error report for GraphQL. But it's not an error code. It's a successful response. But inside there, it has the error message. OK, so because I already have this project, I need to create some other one. And it's created. So here, I, as the request is su successfully executed, I get the response as I want because I asked for this data, right? <coughs> so I asked for the repository's description, ID, URL. And uh, if I go through this URL, 
Let's go. It will be the successfully created project I just created. So <laughs> you can imagine that if you are writing writing these features, you can get the get all the response in one single query. So you can easily write a page that based on the response, based on successful or not, I show an error message or I, or I show a success, successful message and uh, redirect me to the newly created page. That's a mutation. OK. I have created a lot, lot of garbage <laughs> in my account. Yeah, that uh, So that's a little experiment that I just did. And uh, so far, so good? Yeah. Cool. OK, so actually for 101, that's basically everything. Because at least you now know what GraphQL requests look like. Uh, but uh, that's only a little fraction of the whole idea. So later, I'm going to intru introduce something that's related to GraphQL <laughs> that is necessary in your work around this idea. Uh, but not, I don't have a, another workshop like this anymore. So uh, there is a going to, uh, I'm going to answer some questions that I suppose you may have in the several next sl slides. So the first is that, uh, what is GraphQL? Basically, this is not the answer. This is not. But this is something very likely that we will do in our work if you are using GraphQL in your project. We need to define a schema for your data on the server. The schema is something like, like we just see in the docs. Uh, everything in the schema is need to be accessible. You, if the client asks for this field in the schema, you need to be able to answer it. You need to be able to give the data back. But the front end does not care how you generate the data. They don't care. That's the idea. So the first thing, you need to have a schema. But with the schema, there is a lot of work for the back end because you need to deal with the resolvers. You need to answer. You need, you need to know how to answer these queries, right? So you can imagine there, there will be some code. But for my personal experience, I think the code level, the, code, uh, the line of codes will be the same as at least the same as you if you write in the REST way. So it should be acceptable for backend employees, uh, backend engineers, as they are most here, uh, for you to accept that. And the second thing is you need to write a query on the client to get the data you need. So this is for the front-end engineers. As long as the schema is set up, you need to do the, you need to do the queries. You need to send the request to the graph endpoint, like exactly like the HTTP REST request, but in a slightly uh, different and easier way. And uh, another question, why does GraphQL only have one endpoint? So for GraphQL, you only have one endpoint when you ask for some data. But if you want different data, you need to write different queries. If you want to do different things, you write different mutations. That's basically the idea. So this, this is different from REST, right? So I assume that in most companies, we need to maintain a long list of requests for REST. You know, to doing different things, and uh, many of them are not used anymore. But you don't know because <laughs> because I don't uh, I don't have data. Maybe I just don't I just leave it there. Uh, but uh, the effort to maintain the docs is a lot because imagine you just create a new endpoint simply for a small feature, In, instead of just pushing the data on the onto the onto the code base, you need to go to the doc site and uh, change something in the docs. That'll be a uh, there'll be spend some more effort, but for GraphQL, it's actually declared and it's actually very automatic. So it, I'm not I'm not a salesman about GraphQL, but this is real. So if you are writing code for GraphQL endpoint in the backend, it will if you have enough type enough types uh, declared in the code, if you have enough commands as the tool ask, the many tools can help you to generate a docs. Uh, exactly the same as the endpoint is with types, with the comments, with what the endpoint is for. Exactly like the GitHub, GitHub docs, but with very small effort. Uh, that's, the, that's why I think the backend engineer should consider using GraphQL for your future API. It can save a lot of effort. You may not find it at first, but as long as the API is being used and being updated, you can see the effort being very, very useful. <coughs> so, is there any easier way to uh, do uh, API versioning with GraphQL? API version, okay. Uh, so, by API version, you mean that if you update uh, API, the front end need to do something, right? 
uh, like let's say we have version one yeah. and with the major update we have to go to the version two um so do we have to like copy the code and then uh, you know uh okay so uh, as far as i can see uh, in my experience there are many there are some practices some are good some are bad so the first is that they just declare the version number in the in the root the query that's of course uh, one way and the second way is that the front end and the back end they maintain one shared project the shared project is the schema itself so for the schema itself you know everyone knows that the react project may have a dependency with the project with the tools that is depends on so if the number is fixed then the thing it downloads the depends on is fixed so if you update the schema like you said then you, if you're using the shared project then the front end and back end they need to both update their version number and uh, update the dependency that's one way also one way and uh, the third way is that the front end don't need to do anything but uh, uh, when the back end deploys uh, deploys uh, when you deploy the schema file you need to let them know <laughs> yeah because they just send the request but uh, uh, the schema is the only thing it's like a contract sorry it's like a contract between front end and back end so um, I want to build that up a bit, and I, I think it's a really good question regarding GraphQL. In REST APIs, we do usually have root versions, so we're going to have v1, v2, v3, and I think there is a great problem about that. Let's say that I'm a front end like, developer. If you are just switching from v1 to v2, you are doing a major change in my code base. Let's say there are like thousands of people, let's say, in Facebook, consuming for that API and you're passing from V1 to V2 so now there are like gonna be like a thousand people like eight hours per day and know like from Monday to Friday just doing that migra migration so one of the constraints about GraphQL and one thing that I think it is useful is a you shouldn't base a your GraphQL API with root version so basically basically you're, 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 what you are gonna do is a uh, as uh, Mark has mentioned before GraphQL is a strongly typed uh, API, so you're going to have types. So also, there is something called directives. So there is a native GraphQL directive called uh, dep deprecated. So basically, let's say that you have a, 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 a get user by ID, and now you're going to have a get user by uh, by a ar article ID, uh, and you want to <coughs> deprecate that one, and you want to release them the new one. So basically, you are going to just tag that query endpoint, let's say a get with that uh, add deprecated and a message so and then you are gonna just deploy and add a new query with that that, that uh, get a, a uh, whatever by ID uh, so basically the good thing about that is like when the client is trying to fetch the data part from the old endpoint it's gonna get the data but also it's gonna get a message and that message is gonna tell oh man this is gonna be deprecated and it can contest on that, whatever. And it's going to tell you, like, you should use this new field that is going to be used by article ID in order to fetch that data. It's going to contain this new data. And then you can monitorize, like, the activity of that old endpoint that it was de deprecated one year ago. And when you see that there is not call to that endpoint from uh, no, three, six, eight, one year, uh, months or one year, you can say, okay, now it's safe to remove it because we do know that during like five months there were nobody just like calling to this uh, area. Uh, but <coughs> I think it's a really good question. Yeah, the main pain point would be the mobile applications because some people just turn off the updates. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the case. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense, yeah. Cool. But actually you still need to uh, I have to say that you still need to spend this effort at least. It's not a like solve every problem. Yeah. <coughs> okay. And uh, so next question: operation types. Um, like I just demoed, there are queries and the mutations, and there are third type of operation type which is called subscriptions. This is newly introduced in 2017, only to do real time update. So you can imagine that the query I just sent it keeps updating. <coughs> Like there's a query about the list of messages and it's updating. So I just send the <laughs> same format of queries of messages to the backend and uh, it's a web socket. And it's a web socket and it keeps updating and uh, I keep getting the push of the newest events. Uh, that's a sub subscription. But there's a demo video, but uh, you can easily find it online. So I won't play it here. Uh, next question about the 
what is the role of drug pillar in history. Uh, so this is a history of data transportation uh, throughout <coughs> recent, recent years. There is a remote procedural call, RPC. There is SOAP, which I never used. I don't know. I don't know whether you have used. Uh, uh, Oh, Such cool, cool, cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, good to mention that up. Yeah. And uh, REST, everyone have used. And uh, GraphQL. So this is basically the history of data transport. And uh, for everyone, we are definitely most familiar with REST, which is defined in 2000. And uh, they have the very specific endpoints called get, post, put, delete for different purposes. And the backend are writing, keep creating endpoints, keep updating them, and front end are sending requests. That's the way we work now. Okay, so let's imagine a case for the newly created company Pied Piper, uh, who is writing their iOS app. And uh, this app is very simple. It's a social app for Pied Piper, and uh, they have a detail page with user. So let's cl if it, if they click Richard, it will show the Richard page with his recent recent posts and the list of Richard's followers. And uh, this is a case that will happen in the Pied Piper office, which is the small house. And the front end developer Dinesh is trying to is developing the iOS page for this feature, the user the user details page. And the back end engineer is here for you. He need to uh, he need to implement the back end. So Dinesh need to ask. Gear for you endlessly for the for the endpoints for the endpoints because uh, without the endpoints he can basically cannot work. So gear for you, this is the list of gear of the endpoints gear for you gives the Nash uh, for rest. Uh, he gives him three endpoints. The first endpoint is the user uh, is the user endpoints which uh, is user slash ID. So with different ID can give different user detail for the user, but uh, Dinesh is angry. He says, "You don't have, you don't have followers in this page. Uh, you need to add them." Carefully, um, just give him another endpoint called posts, which is users slash id slash posts, which are give we are give a list of posts in JSON format. And the third is the followers. And with these three endpoints, Dinesh can do his work, right? Because he has all the data he wants, but maybe uh, more than he wants. And at least. Imagine you, you are the iOS developer, you need to send three requests in a parallel, and uh, you need to keep the loading status, keep loading until all three requests have the response. And uh, you may need to manage the cache for separate requests. And if, if the product manager he wants something else, you need to have fourth, fifth, sixth endpoints for this page. But now they're using GraphQL, and uh, this, is the only, this is the only endpoint they want. As long as the so uh, this thing will work as long as what Dinesh wants are included in the schema, uh, you can take a seat. Okay, okay, okay. So this is the only request uh, Dinesh will need for the for the request. Uh, it looks the same as what I just sent to the GitHub, right? So sh you guys should be familiar right now about how things will work. And here comes the end the war between. Rest and GraphQL. I find war is interesting because uh, nearly everything has war. React has war with Vue, Rest has Vue with has war with GraphQL, Java has war with everything else. And uh, uh, so here comes the war with Rest and GraphQL. But first thing first, I'm not a salesman for GraphQL, so I need to say first that uh, GraphQL doesn't work under all cases, and uh, under some cases it might be overkill. You need to take a look at your user cases, take a look at your products, take a look at your, maybe even your engineers, you need, you need engineers to do that, right? So you need to consider a specific case uh, for using whether to use GraphQL or not, or simply use REST for your work. Uh, okay, that, that's it first. Now I say why GraphQL is a better REST. Uh, first thing, GraphQL doesn't have overfetching and underfetching. Overfetching and unfetching is uh, two words that appears many times when people are talking about GraphQL and, uh, and uh, REST. They say that if you use GraphQL, overfetching and underfetching will never happen. So I need to explain what is them. Uh, let's suppose still in the Pied Piper, still Dinesh and Gear for you. Uh, what if the what if the iOS program manager he wants to, she wants some 
more features about that page. She wants to add some more things like uh, the first post of each followers. That would be a pain. Because if you're doing the rest, you will first get the list of followers, then do a for each, do into the followers list. For each followers, you need to get the post, right, using the endpoints. Uh, that will definitely be uh, overfetching. Imagine that the user is using using Cynthia, he will pay more for, for this page because there will be more traffic than needed. Uh, underfetching is also the same, but uh, normally underfetching, you just need to select to the backend engineer to ask him to give more data to you. But using GraphQL, normally this case will not happen. And uh, in the same reason, we can save the network. Um, and uh, like I just explained, we can stop managing the docs for REST endpoints uh, because as long as the schema is well maintained, you the doc is automatically generated. Um, for the fourth, the fourth is for startup. I don't know. Yeah, quick question: How many people work in startup? Can okay, raise, raise? Okay, okay. Uh, so for startup, the first thing you need, you may need to be interested in is to rapid development rapid interaction, you need to do things fast. You need to, uh, I need to work fast, with ba including backend engineers. But uh, using, using GraphQL is definitely good for this because you only need, uh, like I said, you only need one endpoint. And with this endpoint, uh, with this schema confirmed, front end and, and back end can do things separately. The front end engineers, they can easily mock, test, uh, which is, oh, not there, but can easily mock and uh, test and uh, Developing things based only on the schema. Whenever their development is ready, like uh, in the in the previous case for PyPiper for their RLS app, they can use data with mock data based on the schema. And uh, when the development is ready, when they f finish developing their page, they can just switch the endpoint to the real endpoint, and the real data comes in. But things will work because they are of the same type, they are of the same format, and that will be very good for startup because. Uh, you can have po very, you can have a lot less meetings between the the engineers, uh, and it's very good for your rapid deve rapid development. <coughs> and the last reason is uh, schema and type system. Uh, so, f basically, these are several reasons why GraphQL is a better rest. But I'm not talking very clearly. If you you c you can go to the Google and search why GraphQL is better, and uh, the first result will be from Apollo and uh, telling you all the details, which is the same as listed here. And uh, the last thing is the schema and type system. So, I'm sorry. So this morning I cannot sleep. I slept on I've, I'm on bed until 12 o'clock, and I still cannot sleep. So I open my iPhone, and uh, the Twitter is in night mode, and I saw Carlos Twitter about this, and uh, he's saying that. Uh, the size of GraphQL says overrated is uh, overfetching and underfetching. Underrated is types and uh, typed and the introspectable contract between server and client. Uh, this is a very good point. I, s I mean, so I, so I tell myself I need to, I need to, I need to say this in tomorrow's meetup. So I keep a screenshot and paste it here, and I forget it's night mode, so it looks very dark. Uh, but uh, the idea is like this. So uh, overfetching and underfetching is things keep. Uh, people keep talking about about why GraphQL is better, but actually types and uh, uh, schema and the uh, type system is also very good for development because uh, on several aspects. First, uh, they have a schema definition language. This is a this is a schema which serves as a contract between client and uh, server. The contract that uh, uh, can eliminate eliminate the meetings and uh, for both sides to develop better and faster. You have better communications. We have types already. They are declared in the contracts in your requests. Every request you send will be response with, with data with the type you want, you expect. So you can easily adopt TypeScript. With some good practice, you can you even just directly use the schema types as your TypeScript type. Uh, third, uh, another survey. How many people use TypeScript? Okay, can be more in this year. Because TypeScript is, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very. I mean, it can improve your efficiency. It seems like you need to write more code, but it can really reduce the error rate in your code, in your JS code, and uh, uh, it can really help with your working efficient.
but with the type system, you can easily support type, type script. And uh, easily more can test, like I just mentioned, because every, every response is expected. Another question is about schema first or code first, but that's an open question. Uh, I don't need to, I, I don't plan to talk about it today, but I expect some of you, if you have some ideas about it, you can share it later. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, so I'm, okay. The, the, the type thing is true for RPC as well, right? What? The type system and scheme. Yeah, as far as I know, yeah, you, you, can have RPC yeah. As well. you, you can have in your RPC, or even like you can create a new like API yeah. like, communication that is going to contain types, but mm. graph, graph could basically get Gives it out of the has board. types and it's easy to implement. So. Sure. All right, time is fly, flying faster than I thought, uh, but still okay. Because I this uh, yesterday I did more slides for introduction, uh, but I didn't expect the time to oh, be yeah, so long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he's waiting. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so for uh, for these links, it's something I prepare for for you guys if you want to pick up GraphQL. These are all very good links which I actually used when I was learning. Uh, I have pasted all of them on the GraphQL Meetup website. You can just go there and, uh, and use them. <laughs> so that's all for one one. I, be, I hope that it helps you to have a very basic knowledge about GraphQL. And uh, if that works, then it's fine. Okay. So I prepared another section, but it will be very quick. I want to go through what happens in last year. Uh, there is a GraphQL Summit last year in, in US. And uh, they, have, they have opened all the recordings on YouTube. And many of them are very good talks. I did, I did take a look at some of them, and uh, they are very, some of them are very helpful. And if you're interested in these topics, you can just go through the YouTube list. I, I will later put the slides on our website, so you can just download and uh, go through the link. And uh, if you are interested in adoption from REST to GraphQL, you can take a look at this Airbnb talk. They just did it in last year, and uh, they have some very useful experience. Uh, for like I just said, for Apollo client, the newest version they have provided the cache support, which uh, help you to improve your performance in your usage. Uh, caching is actually in, in our first meetup. Caching is a problem because the uh, because at that time there is not very good solution about the caching problem, but now it's not anymore. And uh, this is the same thing I just talked. And for API security, like the very good question has, answer, has, has asked, uh, if we don't do any limitation, GraphQL API can have some security issue. Uh, if you don't limit the data, user can, fe can, fetch from you, can fetch as much data from you as, as they want. And they can easily ask for too much data and uh, make, your service, uh, make your service go down. So these are several ways to improve your API security. You can add timeout. You can limit the data. You can limit the depth. You can limit the complexity. All of them have tools. This is the link to the corresponding Apollo um, open source library to do these things. And these are some best practices, but I just listed this here as a possible topics for the for some for some next talk, and also some list for tools. But uh, the best place is to go through the awesome GraphQL page, but you need to pay attention to the quality of the tools because some of them are not maintained. And uh, if you want to ask for something, you go, can go through the list and check whether there is something you want. Thank you. Uh, for QA, I will just leave it later. Okay. Thank you. Leave it later. <coughs> yeah.